Ladies and gentlemen, you're all very welcome to today's event, which is the second in the Development Matters series supported by Irish Aid. My name is David Donoghue. Uh, I'm a former Irish ambassador and director general of Irish Aid, and I will be moderating today's session. We are delighted to be joined today by Jagan uh, Chapagain, the Secretary General of the International Federation of Red Cross and Red Crescent Societies. Um, Mr. Chapagain has been good enough to take time out of an extremely busy schedule to speak to us. He will speak for about 20 minutes uh, and then we will go to Q&A with our audience. You'll be able to join the discussion online using the Q&A function in Zoom, which you will see on your screen. Uh, please feel free to send in questions and comments at any time they occur to you during the session and we will come to them as soon as uh, the Secretary General has finished his presentation. Both the presentation today and the Q&A are on the record. Please feel free to join the discussion on Twitter using the handle at IIEA. We are also live streaming the event, uh, so a very warm welcome to those of you who are joining us via YouTube. Before taking on his present role in February 2020, Jagan uh, Chapagain spent more than 20 years with IF IFRC, uh, across Europe, working across Europe and Asia. He was the Under Secretary General for Programs and Operations. Uh, he was also the Chief of Staff and he was the Director of the Asia uh, Pacific Region at the IFRC. So he brings a, a wealth of experience and operational uh, know-how to, to, to his role. Um, uh, he has played a key role in building leadership uh, to, and in the response to large-scale humanitarian crises and uh, in building resilient communities. I would be, I'd now like to hand the floor to Robert Mead, uh, uh, the Deputy Director of the Humanitarian Unit in Irish Aid, to say a few words on behalf of Irish Aid. Robert? Many, <clears throat> excuse me. Many thanks, David. It gives me great pleasure to welcome here today Mr. Jagan Chapagan, Secretary General of the International Federation of the Red Cross and Red Crescent Societies, the IFRC. This is a very timely visit. The global humanitarian landscape is increasingly challenging and complex and evolving rapidly. We as the humanitarian community are today facing some of the most severe challenges in seeking to respond to unprecedented interlinked humanitarian needs. Secretary General Shapigan, you have recently returned from the Horn of Africa where famine is unfolding and you would have witnessed firsthand the devastation that millions of people are facing and how also the ongoing war in Ukraine is compounding food insecurity there and elsewhere. On top of this, we constantly see now how recurring natural disasters and climate change are drivers of hunger and displacement and how conflict also adds to this. Adherence to the humanitarian principles of humanity, impartiality, neutrality and independence provide the foundation for humanitarian action. They are essential if we are to deliver humanitarian assistance to those who need it most. Yet more than ever, these principles are under increased scrutiny and pressure. The theme of the Secretary General's address today principled humanitarian action in complex humanitarian emergencies has never been as relevant and important as it is now. As the world's largest humanitarian organization, the IFRC is a key partner for Ireland. It is uniquely positioned to act as a first responder to provide immediate response to sudden emergencies. It does so working through its network of over 190 Red Cross and Red Crescent member national societies and through its 14 million volunteers, members and staff globally. Ireland has provided over 30 million in funding to the IFRC since 2010. And I am therefore delighted that the Secretary General has the opportunity to engage with a wider Irish audience today. As David said, Secretary General Shafagan assumed his role in early 2020, having spent his career working across Europe and Asia for the IFRC. And prior to being appointed Secretary General, he served as Under Secretary General for Programs and Operations and guided 
and guided the IFRC relief and development efforts around the world. He also served previously as Chief of Staff and Director of the Asia Pacific region, providing crucial leadership during large scale humanitarian crises. Ireland is a long standing and vocal champion of principled humanitarian action. It informs every aspect of our humanitarian support, from our funding to our partnerships to, and, and our advocacy. But what do we need to do collectively now to ensure that these standards are upheld and to ensure that we continue to strengthen humanitarian action and to improve prevention of yet more hunger crises? Your wealth of experience, Secretary General Shabagan, can perhaps give us some insight today on what needs to change. It gives me great pleasure now to hand over to you, Secretary General, and thank you once again for joining us today. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ambassador David Donahue and, uh, and Robert Mead. Thank you so much. And uh, thank you for welcoming me and giving me this beautiful room here in your office. <laughs> it's amazing, actually, <laughs> uh, to, 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 be, to be with you here. Uh, it's, it's truly my honor that um, I could come here and share some thoughts with you. Um, you mentioned, of course, a number of things I did, but the one of the things I did that I value the most in my life has been um, a young volunteer. At the age of 14, I started volunteering for Red Cross in Nepal, I come from I come from Nepal, and that experience is um, a young man uh, trying to make a little difference, uh, you know, with very little uh, that I had at my disposal. Of course, with my colleagues and uh, and, and friends in my school, uh, had set up uh, set myself to be who I am today, uh, and I value that experience the most uh, um, in 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 my life. Now. Um, just to share some of the some of my thoughts on on of course to start with today's uh, today's situation in the world. Uh, let me share with you um, some of the things maybe pre COVID, uh, pre COVID, just before the COVID, how the world looked like. And I have been saying that actually our the generation, which is living in the best time in the history pre-COVID, <laughs> best time in the history. If you look at it, the longest life expectancy in the history, if you look at the, you know, the recorded history, we had the highest, longest life expectancy. Networking has never been easier the way it is today. Though those of us who like sports, the sports have never been better. Those of us who like shopping, the shopping has never been better or easier now with all, all the online shoppings and all the shopping malls. Technology has never been better. Healthcare has never been better. And this was the life in this world, just pre-COVID. So that means the wealth, the science, the technology, the health, the education, we are living in the best time in the world. But at the same time, there are also other statistics. And I want to share with you these statistics from pre-COVID time. I don't have the latest uh, right now in my hand. Pre-COVID, two years ago, over 700 people, 700 million people were living on less than two US dollars a day. About 71% of the world population lived on 10 US dollar a day. That was the statistics, two US dollar a day, not a lot. One billion people lived in slums, which could be doubled by 2030. And we actually, we could reach that number sooner now because of the, the, the COVID and climate impact. More than 1 billion people in developing countries have inadequate access to water. And I'm just using the word water, not clean water. Over 815 million people around the world go to bed hungry every evening. Over 205 million people are affected by weather related disasters annually, more than 90% in developing world. 
Around 37 million people are living with HIV, about 5,000 infections per day. 5,000 infections per day. Over 15,000 children under five die daily from preventable diseases like malaria and diarrhea. That's one every six seconds. One child dies from preventable diseases every six seconds. So while we had this world, which if you compare with the past, is supposedly the best time in the world, these are some of the statistics that existed pre-COVID-19. And these statistics are probably much worse now. I think I can confidently say that these statistics are much worse now than they were two years ago. I wanted to share this with you because this must, this must hit us. This must show us the inequity that exists in the world. The best and the most likely the worst at the same time. And this should wake us, all of us. Let me share with you maybe the three major, three major crises facing the world today. And just to remember easily, I call them three C's. <laughs> the first C is the climate crisis. I think uh, I have been saying this, and, and I truly believe in this, that the most consequential of the crisis we are dealing today is the climate crisis. I think its impact, its a global impact, and its long-lasting impact would be actually uh, probably one of the, you know, one of the most serious impact on humanity is coming from climate. It's not only disasters. Of course, the, we know the number of disasters have increased, the frequency, the death it, it, it brings, it has increased. But its impact on everything else is massive on the environment, on the, on the food, uh, food productions, on energy consumption, massive, massive impact uh, climate is having. The second C is of course COVID-19. And as we saw the impact of COVID-19 on, on populations, on the health infrastructure, and not only developing world, I think for the first time we felt that we had a disease which actually affected almost everybody. But we also know that its impact was felt differently. While it, have, it affected everybody, its in, impact was felt differently. The people living in the poorer world, the marginalized communities, the refugees, the migrants, the people living in the slums, um, I think they were affected disproportionately higher. And it again showed the inequity that exists in the world. Uh, even on a pandemic like COVID-19, we were actually very selfish. The science did very well. I think there was a very good collaboration among the scientists. So we came up with the vaccine very, very quickly. But then we started becoming very selfish. We started keeping vaccines for ourselves. While now in the West, um, I see in Ireland, I currently live in Geneva, where you know we have no restrictions, but you go to Africa, the vaccination rate hovers around 15 to 16 percent today. And this is a virus as we saw. The Omicron, when we saw this in South Africa, it took it took less than 48 hours to reach Europe. So even for a virus like that, we forgot the importance of creating equity and basically serving everybody and reaching out to the people who need the most. So I think the COVID-19, of course, it had a direct impact, the health impact, the socioeconomic impact, the organizational impact, but also it created that inequity, or it made the inequity even worse. And of course, the third C I talk about is conflict. And right now, of course, being in Europe, um, the conflict in Ukraine, of course, is very much in the forefront of, of of everybody. But of course, there are conflicts happening. Uh, until 23rd of February, all the news <laughs> was about Afghanistan. And after 24th, I think um, as if like the, 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 the situation in Afghanistan is over. Unfortunately, it's not. It's getting worse. Of course, the Syria, Yemen, part of Sahel, and of course, other many parts of the world, the conflict is still very much there and it's affecting millions of people domestically and millions of people are actually leaving the, leaving the countries. So 
The combined impact of climate crisis, COVID-19, and conflict is creating more disasters, it's creating more diseases. I think it's not only COVID-19, but uh, you know, the Ebola we saw, right now we are just hearing about monkeypox, you know, chikungunya in Africa, number of other diseases are coming there. And of course, the non-communicable diseases are actually now affecting hundreds of millions of people, almost as much as the communicable diseases are affecting, if we take the pandemic, pandemic out. Could they are creating displacement? The cli climate is creating displacement, conflict is creating displacement. Now the COVID-19 is also creating displacement because people are looking for opportunities, the economic opportunities, the health facilities opportunities. They are also creating disparity. As you, as you saw during the COVID-19, certain group of people became richer, much, much richer. The billionaires became multi-billionaires white. I think the poorer became much, much poorer. So it has created that gap even bigger. And we also saw a, a, a discrimination and growing discrimination. So the collective impact of three Cs, <laughs> climate, COVID and conflict is exasperating what I call five Ds, the disasters, diseases, displacement, disparity, and discrimination. And this is not a very pretty situation to be. If this continues, if this trend continues, and, and people feel discriminated, people feel excluded, the disparity continues to grow and there is not a sufficient global solidarity, at one point it starts impacting the global security and the, and the, and, and the global peace. So these are not only for our individual well-being or the community well-being, these are also important for the global peace and, 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 and global security. Now, how can we, of course, tackle these things? And of course, there could be many, many ideas. But as a, as, as a humanitarian, I would just like to share with you uh, three simple basic uh, basic ideas um, I feel are very important as a, as, a, as, as a humanitarian. The first one, the first one I feel is I think we need to have a bigger ability to listen and learn. Listen to the communities, listen to the people, you know, who are actually living on this uh, on sometimes some of these terrible conditions of conflict. And as David mentioned, Ambassador David just mentioned, I was recently in Horn of Africa. I visited a town uh, called Ileret. Uh, 21,000 people live there. And because of the failing crops for the last two years in a row, and because these are agro-pastoralist communities, and many of the animals also died because of no rain. I witnessed the global acute malnutrition rate of 53.6% in that town. And for your reference, 15% of malnutrition rate is considered emergency. 15, 1.5% is considered emergency. And in that town, the rate was 53.6%. Now, as we have seen in Africa, the cycle of drought, of course, those of us older ones would remember the TV pictures from 84 and 85. But we don't have to go that back. Just in 2012, 11, 12, we had 270,000 people who died because of hunger in Somalia. That was just 10 years ago. So that means we have seen this cycle of drought happening every few years. But somehow, despite all the richness, all the progress I described in the beginning, we seem to be able to unable to find a more sustainable solutions. And this is why the importance of listening and learning comes into play. We got to listen to the communities, the people living in these areas on what they are seeing and what they are feeling and what they are experiencing and learning from that to adapt. 
our humanitarian and development action, working with community, listening with communities, and not imposing solutions, but working together to find solutions. So this listening and learning becomes a very important element, putting the communities and people at the center of what we do. A lot of times, the focus is not the communities. A lot of time, focus is not the people, but the focus becomes the politics. Focus becomes multiple other things. Focus becomes how the rich people can become richer. And that's not helping us to find the solutions. That's throwing millions of people into poverty. And right now, in Horn of Africa, just three countries, Kenya, Ethiopia, and Somalia, 14 million people are on the verge of starvation. That was the word used when I visited there, on the verge of starvation. And the inequity we see in many parts of the world and also in equity we see on how we respond to also the crisis. And, uh, and I did have a, a very challenging conversation with some of the journalists when I, was, uh, when I was in Africa. I was heavily challenged for in their eyes, not being balanced on responding to their needs. And they were comparing with how we have responded to the conflict in Ukraine and how we are responding to the food insecurity situation in Africa. So right now, as we are, of course, the Ukraine needs to be helped and the Ukrainian populations, particularly the civilian population, need to be supported. But at the same time, what they feel is that their suffering is somehow classified as second class or third class because most of our humanitarian response plans for Africa are very, very poorly funded. They are 10%, 15% funded. So how do we address this, this, this inequity on how we re respond to human suffering? So I think really listening and listening to the people, pu putting people at the center, pu putting community at the center and learning from them and learning from the experience becomes a very important element of principle humanitarian action moving forward. Major principle, put the people and the community at the center. The second aspect I want, to, I want to share with you is, and which sort of links to the first point I was making earlier, is how do we get more fair and smart financing? What is happening now is, a lot of the financing for the last 50, 60 years is coming from 20 to 30 same donors. And, and, and I know sometimes these donors get criticized for not doing enough. But on the other hand, they have been the donors really embracing the burden, if I can use that word, of humanitarian and development support to the world. At every crisis come, these are the same donors who are putting resources all the time. This cannot be sustainable. But also there are other countries who are now capable of sharing that responsibility. So spreading that responsibility to more contributors, more governments, more donors becomes extremely, extremely important. But I also want to emphasize that we have to go beyond the donors are the traditional government donors. I think the private sector has a very, very important role to play. And as we saw during the COVID-19, um, in, in our response, the response of the International Federation of Red Cross and Red Crescent Societies, we got a massive support from the private sector. At one point, actually, this support was bigger than the support we got from the, from the government. We are also seeing a very similar level of support from the private sector towards the Ukraine crisis. But one important thing, one important lesson we learned out of this is the private sector just doesn't want to be the people who write the check, but they also want to be part of the process. So it's extremely important that we stop seeing the private sector as just the provider of the funding, but also provider of the ideas and provider or being a true partner on developing the ideas and developing those shared ideas and the co-creation 
so that they become part of the solutions rather than just writing the checks. And this is an important element of how we can engage the private sector in our humanitarian development and climate initiative. And then the third element of this is we also have to be much more innovative on, 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 on financing. How can we create innovative financing me mechanism that exists or that can exist around the world? Engaging the insurance companies and a lot of the, the, the other mechanism that can come from the you know, multinational development banks or the Islamic financing, for example. Uh, you know, there are billions of dollars available as part of the Islamic financing mechanism of Jakarta and Shukuks and all those types of things. So how do we have a broader share of the contributors, the donors, and not focusing on the same 20 or 30 who have been playing that responsibility for far too long? The secondly, how do we get private sector into, into uh, uh, the process and they become the part of the co-creation and, and part of the shared leadership. And how would we actually embrace the innovative financing? I think it would be extremely important to have that smart financing. The second aspect of the financing is how do we get humanitarian financing, development financing, and climate financing working in sync rather than in silos? At the moment, there is a humanitarian financing that goes separately. There is a development financing that goes separately. And then, of course, there is a huge climate finance. And they are not working in integrated manner. So we got to break that cycle. If you look at the communities, you know, the communities don't differentiate their needs. There's a humanitarian needs, a development needs, or a climate needs. The, the, you know, the communities have needs. They have needs, they have aspirations, they have rights. So it's very important that we actually respond to their needs, aspirations, and rights rather than you know, putting them in silos. So this would be a very important element of smart financing moving forward. Another element of the, of, of the smart financing is how do we actually do our development and humanitarian work that is climate smart? A lot of the development if we consider the climate consideration as part of our development, we don't need to then have a separate investment as a climate investment because this is already made part of the development processes. So basically making our humanitarian and development or climate smart would actually save us a lot of resources and will save lives and livelihoods because they will be more disaster resistant development, basically saving uh, lives and, and livelihoods and economy moving forward. So I think these are the elements of uh, you know, the smart financing. Now, the smart financing also have to be fair, fair in the sense more equitable. And, and this is one thing what we are seeing right now is we saw in the COVID-19 response, I think it was not a very equitable response and which I thought was not very smart uh, not, to, not to invest on, on some of the countries um, uh, in a very timely manner. The vaccination was not equitably done um, and I think that definitely prolonged the, 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 the virus and still the new, um, new variants are coming. I hope, touch wood, you know, they will not be as bad as the previous variants have been. But the, but the fact that new variants of uh, COVID-19 are emerging continues to demonstrate that it is still a threat. So it's very important that a, a, a equitable distribution of resources to the countries that need the most is very important part of smart financing. And the third element I want to share with you is about the leadership. And I think as we have seen now with all the challenges we are seeing in the world, of course, the, the, the Ukraine conflict being the closest here in, 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 in Europe, but the food insecurity crisis, the climate crisis we are seeing, all the development crisis we are seeing, the energy crisis we are seeing, the food prices going up now, you know, the millions of people having to move every year demonstrate that globally, we haven't been able to exercise the leadership that is needed to address some of these challenges or hopefully prevent some of these challenges and manage some of these challenges better. And my contention is that in today's globalized world, today's interconnected world, 
I think the definition of the leadership needs to change. I think this is a time for more humble leadership, more inclusive leadership. The strength of new leadership is about their humility. The, the, the strong leader, I think traditionally the image of strong leaders, the macho leaders, I think that's not what will be effective in today's world. I think that's the type of leadership actually that contributes to the type of challenges we are facing in today's world. So we need a more humble leadership who are willing to lead with humility in a more inclusive manner. We also need the leadership that values the traditions. As I mentioned in the beginning, the world has made huge progress. That means we have done some good things along the line in the history. It's very important that we learn from the good things we have done in the history and value that tradition. But at the same time, we do need the leadership which embraces innovation, who is not afraid to experiment and innovate and actually adapt the approaches to today's world, today's globalized world, today's digitalized world, today's network world. And it's a very different world we live than the world we lived, say, 40 years ago. So in summary, we have been living the best time in the history, but still the world has been facing terrible statistics. Millions and millions, hundreds and hundreds of millions of people suffer and this must not be acceptable. The combined effect of three Cs, the climate, COVID-19 and conflict is actually creating a major challenges for this world. And in summary, I described that as disasters, diseases, displacement, disparity, and discrimination. And to try to address this, I believe that we must listen and learn from the communities and from others. We must have more fair, equitable, and smart financing and investment. And we need the new type of leadership which values tradition, which embraces innovation, which leads with inclusive approach and needs leads with humility. These are the few things I want to share with you and let me stop it here. Over to you, Ambassador. Jagan, thank you very, very much. It was a, a, a real tour de force. You make a, a number of uh, very powerful points about the world we, we find ourselves in at the moment. Uh, the, the three C's sums up the key challenges, but I, I was particularly struck by what you said towards the end there about the need for a different kind of leadership, uh, more and more humble and 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 inclusive. I mean, that, that brings me perhaps to the, the first question we have, which is from Pat Gibbons of University College Dublin. And Pat, thanks you for your, for your excellent talk. And he just wanted to follow up on this idea of global leadership. And he's wondering really, uh, but his, his question came in before you made the point about the uh, humble leadership, but he's asking about the capacity of the UN system in general to provide leadership in relation to the three Cs. But perhaps if you could respond, if you were good enough to respond to Pat's question, but also then develop a little bit more the idea of um, of, of humble leadership. I'm, I, you know, I'm to be a little bit provocative. I'm struck by the fact that in the Ukraine crisis, the UN Secretary General has been, to be honest, struggling to find a, a, a way for the UN to connect. And some people would, would argue that in a way, the UN needs to be more assertive. Um, I feel you're right, actually. I prefer your approach, but you know there are, there are different ways of looking at it. The risk is that the UN might appear to be almost uh, uh, removed from the equation if it is not assertive enough, but perhaps you would address some of those points relating to leadership. No, very, very, very happy to. Uh, I think the, um, uh, maybe let me start from uh, humility doesn't mean weakness. Huh? Yes. Uh, humility doesn't mean not being persistent. Um, I think the, you can still be humble and be very persistent, <laughs> but you do it in an inclusive manner. I think the, one of the challenge of the leadership you see many times is, it becomes an exclusive approach. And when you need to, when we have to 
you know, I remember a quote from, I think it was from JFK. He says that actually you negotiate with your enemies or your adversaries, you know, you, you don't negotiate with your friends. So that means the humble leadership has the strength and courage to go and talk to the people you may not necessarily agree with. People may have different philosophies than yours. And that's the type of leadership who is not afraid to go and talk to the people. And, and, and for me, that's, that's the type of leadership that is missing now. A lot of times we hear the language of threat and intimidation. And if you don't agree with me, we will do this and we will do that. When that's the talk that comes from the leadership, it's very, very difficult to find solutions. Now, coming to the UN, and I think, um, although I don't represent the UN here, okay. uh, um, but we are also a membership organization. You know, we also have 192 members. Uh, the UN has 193. Um, but I think what happens with, with the membership organization, for the membership organization to be effective, the members have to come together. And I think the, one of the challenges the UN has at the moment is the members are not coming together. So we can criticize Antonio uh, Guterres for not being very effective, but he doesn't vote on the Security Council. <laughs> It's the members who vote on the Security Council. It's the members who have the vetoes in the Security Council. So if the members don't come together with that approach of humility and inclusivity, it will be extremely difficult for the UN to exercise that leadership that we all expect from, uh, from, from the UN, uh, UN in, the, in, the, uh, in, the, in, in the Ukraine crisis. Now, of course, it's very difficult to see how the Ukraine crisis will evolve. But I think the, the people who are part of the conflict, all of them have said that at the end of the day, the solution will be on the negotiating table. All of them are saying that. So to come to the negotiating table, I don't think the language of threat and, and uh, intimidation will bring people on the table. So I, I even in the Ukraine conflict situation, I do hope that we will have leaders hopefully from the member states, who will have that inclusive approach and that courage to be able to talk to all sides, including the sides with whom they don't agree with, would be extremely, extremely important moving forward. Thank you very much, Agan. Um, another question from Suzanne Keating, uh, who is with Irish Aid. And Suzanne, in a way, she, she builds on what you were saying about um, listening and learning. Uh, but she asks, you know, how do, on the one hand, we need to listen and learn, but on the other hand, at the same time, we have to work quickly and, and to, to scale up to, to, to save lives. Or, uh, are these two things contradictory? That if, you know, listening and learning implies a certain uh, patient process, but often we don't have the luxury, this is my own uh, take on it, we don't have the luxury to um, uh, to, to uh, have that reflection, we need to act quickly in practical terms. Is there a sort of a tension between those two? And are there, uh, can you give a practical example of where it might work, ideally in the Horn of Africa context? Actually, they are not contradictory at all. Actually, they are, uh, um, actually by not doing that, I have seen uh, the organizations creating more problem than solving. I have seen humanitarians parachuting, um, I mean, including in my own country in 2015, earthquake. I used to be the regional director at that time uh, for Asia Pacific and earthquake hit my own country. And as the country was welcoming, within first week, we have hundreds and hundreds of people parachuting to the country. They love Nepal, so they all came there. But they would not spend few hours to listen to what is actually going on in the country. What is actually happening? What is a national plan? Or is there a national plan or not? What others are doing? Not spending few hours, not talking to the local partners, actually created a much bigger mess. Much bigger mess, lot of duplication of the efforts, lot of actually wasters of time and lot of frustration because people want to move very fast and they find out that actually somebody else is already there doing something which they wanted to do or people bringing stuff which was actually not needed. People were, people were actually needing medicines, but then people are coming with food, for example. And, and people are bringing, and, and this was in another situation, 
uh, another crisis actually um, the, the the tsunami uh, that hit uh, uh, you know Indonesia and and Sri Lanka people actually sending winter clothes uh, for Banda Aceh because it was December so people thought that actually it must be cold if people had just listened to the local communities that actually you don't need winter clothes even if it is December in Banda Aceh you know people can still go in t-shirts and shorts so actually spending few hours to listen actually makes your response faster, not slower. And as I have done many, many operations myself on the field, actually these are not contradictory at all. Thank you very much, Agan. A question from Keelan O'Sullivan, who is uh, with the IIEA. Uh, Secretary General, you touched on the shift in global attention from, for example, Afghanistan to Ukraine. How do you foresee the war in Ukraine impacting humanitarian crises uh, in, in, you know, in particular those in Africa in the longer term? I mean, what is going to be the, 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 the longer term effect of the Ukraine crisis and what the IFRC has to do there? I think the, you know, uh, first is of course, the immediate concerns are very, very high. Um, just this morning, I was reading that the food prices have gone by around 45% in Africa. Uh, because Africa has been importing huge amount of wheat from Russia and Ukraine, uh, and that, of course, supply has been disrupted right now. Uh, so already 14 million people just heard in Africa on the verge of starvation with 45% increase in the food prices. The increase in the energy prices, of course, a massive, massive impact that will be immediately. Um, and as we see, of course, the resources are limited. <laughs> they are not infinite resources. That means the enough resources not going to Afghanistan. Uh, enough resources not going to places like Syria and Yemen, of course, meaning there is a humanitarian suffering, of course, I think the humanitarian suffering is going to get worse, but there could also be the implications for the stability of, of some of those, um, uh, those authorities in those countries. Huh? And, um, you know, when, once the instability comes, you don't know whether the new people coming to power would be better than the people who are in power right now. I mean, you don't know that. So, uh, so I think that my sense is there is a real immediate humanitarian concern in many of the countries, particularly in Africa, Afghanistan, and some of the Middle Eastern countries. Now, in the, in the mid-term and the long-term impact, of course, I mean, at this stage, it's a bit difficult to uh, assess. Uh, I mean, we still don't know how the, how the conflict would unfold, you know, how it will end. A lot of uh, lot of it will also depend on how the conflict will end, or will it end? Uh, I think th this will impact. Uh, uh, this will have a, a, a major impact on how might things might develop in the medium and long term. But right now, I think we are seriously concerned with the with with, with its immediate impact on on humanitarian issues. I think from our side, we are trying to do a couple of things. First is joining forces with others. Just a few weeks ago, actually, we had, um, David, of course, you would know the, the IESC Interagency Steering Committee mechanism, all the principles we came together in Geneva, we shared out notes, and we agreed to work together to actually highlight all the issues on the world and try to keep the attention on some of this crisis. And we are doing this in a systematic manner now. The second thing is, of course, we mobilize our local resources and local network uh, luckily for us, you know, we are present in almost every country, in almost all major communities, and with our volunteer workforce, working with other partners to try to bring immediate, uh, immediate relief to the extent we can. But we do depend on a generosity of the donors uh, to be able to do that. The third thing is really advocating the few of the points I was making before, and also bringing some of our knowledge and learning especially the food crisis situation in Africa. Maybe I think so sim simplistically, I don't know. But Africa has a massive arable land. Mm -hmm. The agriculture can be built in Africa. And somehow, you know, introducing innovations on some of the agricultural techniques, I think investing or encouraging the, the, the governments and the partners to invest on a different way of doing the agriculture. And maybe also have a relook on the agro-pastoralist communities. Is it still a sustainable model 
for the, for the future. I know there have been some discussions for the last number of years. So we are also advocating and supporting some of, the, some of these works uh, in, the, in, in the region. Of course, you know, our contribution would be quite small compared to what is needed. But if all of us contribute in a coordinated manner, hopefully we can make a, a reasonable, reasonable difference in, 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 in people's life. But to be very honest with you, uh, the medium and long-term impact of the, the, the Ukraine conflict, we are still analyzing. We are still analyzing. Yeah. Thank you very much, Agan. Um, I just threw in a question of my own. Uh, I mean, how do you think the localization agenda, which was agreed at the World Humanitarian Summit a few years ago, how do you think that is progressing? Is, is it moving quickly enough? I mean, how, how does the IFRC uh, feel about that? Uh, in totality, it hasn't moved the way it should. <laughs> I think it's become probably a lot of talk and not enough action. I think the, the, and my first point about listening and learning from the communities is all about really localization. Yeah. Um, and, and it hasn't sufficiently happened uh, for, for, for a number of reasons. One is I think there hasn't been enough incentives, if I can use the word, uh, for, for localization. And, and, and I have challenged that, um, what I call the intermediate organizations. Huh? So of course we have the donors putting the resources and we have the local communities and the organizations actually delivering on the ground. And we have the UN system and the international organizations and the NGO, including my organization is the intermediate organization. And I believe that we as an intermediate organizations have to push ourselves consciously to actually listen, learn from the communities and invest on the communities for localization to succeed. And this hasn't happened sufficiently. And I have been actually the one asking for a more challenge to us. Now, within, the, within my organization, during COVID-19, we pushed the localization agenda very, very hard. And just to give you any statistics, that out of 2.5 billion roughly globally, we mobilized for COVID-19 response more than 2 billion was mobilized locally, nationally, and only less than half billion was mobilized internationally. And for me, if we consciously try and work with 192 member societies, you could see that around 80% of the resources and capacity was mobilized domestically. And that's sort of the direction we want to push collectively, uh, collectively together. But there is not, there is, there hasn't been enough incentive. I know there have been some good efforts. So I, do, I don't, I don't want to be just uh, critical. Also, I know a number of organizations have tried, um, but if we don't commit to change ourselves more drastically, I don't think we will achieve the local, the, the, the aim of the localization uh, agenda. So we, as an intermediate organization, have to change more drastically. We need to have a much harder look on ourselves and be able to, and, and be challenge ourselves to be, are we lean enough? Are we cost efficient enough and have that courage? But at the same time, David, and sometimes this becomes a bit controversial, but I will say it. <laughs> what we also invest, we also have to invest on capacity building of the local actors, the community actors. And one of the capacity that we have to build to assure the donors is around what is called the accountability. There are clearly much bigger demands from the taxpayers on how the humanitarian and development assistance being used. So that means that every organization, both the international and the local organization must be able to have a transparent risk management capacity, accountability capacity, so that the resources that are provided are spent properly, recorded properly, and reported properly. So I think there is a, I think the donors have to continue to push this agenda and not get disillusioned <laughs> because there is a fear of disillusionment. The intermediate organizations like mine will have to look much more harder ourselves and my organization is doing that right now. And the local actors will have to have that, you know, the ambition to learn, 
and strengthen their capacity so that they can become even more transparent and even more accountable organizers. If we put all these things together, I think the real, uh, localizing will be a success. Great, Jagan. Thank you very much for that. Um, a question, uh, a more specific question from Kean Fitzgerald of the IIEA. Um, in any humanitarian operation, of course, access to water is a very important uh, uh, dimension. So Kean asks really for your comment on what's called strategic damming, you know, where you where water supplies are are exploited um, politically or are instrumentalized um, by one or other player. Um, and he gives a couple of examples of that. Do you think that there is something that the IFRC can do to, to mitigate the damage done um, when uh, to civilians by the instrumentalization of, of water access? Um, I have to be humble here. <laughs> I think, uh, you know, some of the big examples you have given, uh, I don't know how much we can influence except yeah. to advocate for the, 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 the impact it's having on people. I think that's probably our main contribution. But on our day-to-day -day work, you know, on, on, on our emergency response, uh, in, in also in our longer term community-based best work, water and sanitation becomes a very important, uh, important part of our work. We have defined some, uh, what we call the flagship program. And one of our flagships is water and sanitation. Actually, the sanitation is the most neglected uh, area of the work in, 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 in humanitarian development work, actually. Um, and of course, you know, with the poor sanitation, uh, its impact, particularly on health, becomes very, 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 very severe. So on humanitarian settings, actually, um, you know, when you have to respond to an immediate crisis or sudden impact crisis, we do have actually quite well established uh, capacity, what we call the water units and sanitation units. These are called the emergency response units. We can deploy them actually quite rapidly. And, uh, and, and, and these units uh, can purify water and distribute very, very quickly. You know, they can just get any source of water they can purify and, uh, and distribute in different ways. Uh, put in the jerry cans, truck it, or have a water points uh, in, in, in the areas affected. And, and, and we do have these units placed in a number of countries, uh, mostly in Europe, but they can be uh, sipped very, very, very quickly. And in the, in the more normal uh, community-based resilience building programs, uh, uh, you know, we have joined forces with other organizations like the WHO, the UNICEF, and others, Bill and Melinda Gates foundations around how do we eradicate cholera? Uh, and, and, and one of the elements of the eradication of cholera is of course investing in water and sanitation. And there are roughly 30 endemic countries with, with cholera. That's where we are, we are putting uh, our attention. So I think our contribution is much more around, um, around you know, reducing the suffering of the communities from the impact of some of the water shortages and maybe more humble contributions towards some of the major, you know, damn issues uh, that's creating, of course, the water shortages. Thank you, Jonathan. Um, we probably have time for about two or three final questions, if you're good enough to 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 stay for them. Um, one is that there's a, a another one from Pat Gibbons of UCD who makes an interesting point about, uh, I mean, the, 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 let's say a possible tension between involving the private sector more uh, in humanitarian action, giving them more ownership of the process, and at the same time you want to allow for principled humanitarian uh, uh, action. So is there a potential, this is my own take, is there a potential contradiction between um, giving the private sector a greater involvement and on the other hand trying to stick to the fundamental principles of humanitarian action? Uh, it's a very, uh, it's a very, very important point, and I think, uh, um, you know, the, one of the things uh, that's extremely important for us in our partnership with the private sector has been non-negotiable, non-negotiable conditions, and that's our seven fundamental principles, and that is something <laughs> is is not negotiable, but where they can actually contribute is much more at the program design, program development, you know, use of data and the decision making. And I found that we can actually learn a lot from them. They already have very well-tested uh, systems and mechanism 
So actually there is so much learning that can happen from them on that aspect. And even on the policy development and things like that, uh, you know, a lot of private sector seems very, very good on using the data and inform their policy and strategic decision based on data. And those are the type of things we can learn. So I think you raised a very, very important point. I think the next time I talk, I, I will differentiate it more specifically in the very beginning, that the seven fundamental principles we have that are non-negotiable, also in our relations with the governments. Huh? This is not only the private sector. Um, also in our uh, uh, discussion with the government, you know, we don't really compromise on those principles. Great, Jack, and thank you very much for that. And then uh, uh, two questions finally, um, Andrew Gilmore, um, who, who who makes the point um, that, you know, you, you talk about um, listening to people who are most affected by humanitarian crisis. Is there some way in which the IFRC itself can give voice to those people? I, I mean, Andrew uses the word platform. I, I, I mean, it makes a lot of sense that you would some way try to enable them to to express their 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 views on on the predicaments they find themselves in. And then a, a question from Dara Lawler about debt sustainability. I mean, obviously, after COVID-19, this has become a bigger topic again, uh, debt sustainability in emerging market and developing economies. Um, and now there are risks posed by high levels of global inflation, uh, so, and, and possibly there'll be these risks would be exacerbated by monetary tightening in developed economies. So all in all, we have challenges in relation to debt. And if you were good enough just to offer your own perspective on that as, as our final question. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. I think <laughs> on the on the on the first questions, yes. Uh, we have developed this, uh, I mean, we developed this concept actually uh, in a systematic manner after the Indian Ocean tsunami in 2004. And that's when I think the, the, the big emphasis came around having to listen to the, to the, to the affected populations. Huh? Uh, and of course, over the years, those concepts have now developed uh, much more and I think they have become much more sophisticated. And right now, what we, we call it a community engagement and accountability, a CEA, that's what we call. And, and, I, and actually, we used that during the Ebola crisis in, in, in DRC. Uh, and that was extremely important. As you know, you know, with all the stigma attached and all the rumors around the, around the Ebola. Uh, and as you know, this, was, this is one of the crises where you don't have a problem of everybody flooding in because generally people are running away. Uh, but of course, for us as a Red Cross, you know, our volunteers come from the community, so they don't have anywhere to run to. So we have to adapt ourselves in, uh, in, in working in the communities. And one thing that came very clear uh, during the Ebola crisis was that the, you know, the dead bodies were much more contagious uh, with, the, with the Ebola virus. So how do you manage the dead body was a critical element of breaking the chain of infection. So we took the responsibility because you know the families don't hand over the deceased body of their family members very easily. So the organization they could trust were the Red Cross. So we accepted that responsibility having no prior experience on how to actually do, uh, and, and we call it you know, a dignified burial of the, uh, of, the, of, the, of, the, of the deceased. But soon there was of course the rumors going around. Oh, these people are stealing the livers and the heart or whatever, whatever of, the, of our family members. And, and that's when we had to listen to the communities very, very quickly, where these rumors are coming, how can, what can we do to, to address those? So first is by listening, we figured out that there were rumors. And then we found out where the rumors are coming was, as you know, the body bags are generally black, non-transparent body bags. So we immediately disposed those body bags and we bought the transparent body bags. And we invited the families and offered them, you know, this protective gear so they could actually see the safe and dignified burials of their family members. And it's, I'm just giving one example yeah. of, by just listening and very quickly learning and adapting. And it became, you know, a very successful program and contributed massively in actually stopping the, 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 the Ebola virus uh, in, in, in DRC and of course in some other countries. So we do have this and now we are working with UNICEF and others. Uh, and this was one of the big part of our work in COVID-19 was listening to people and, and, and trying to understand what is 
what is affecting them and adapting our uh, approaches. And actually within the first couple of months, we identified that the mental health was going to be one of the biggest issues of the COVID-19. And we identified that not through scientific research, <laughs> just by listening to people, uh, you know, our ordinary volunteers, listening to ordinary people. So in March already, we identified that the mental health was going to be a major problem. Uh, so we do have this, uh, we do have this platform, but of course, these are focused primarily around the humanitarian issues and the, and the challenges they are facing. Um, but also issue around the protection, you know, the sexual exploitation abuse and all those type of things. Uh, these uh, platforms can be can be used. Uh, and now because of COVID-19, we have made them really broad now uh, globally. On, on the final topic, I have to be a bit careful because I'm not an expert on, on some of these topics. Uh, but as we are currently seeing in Sri Lanka, um, uh, so I think that your question is a very valid question. Uh, that will will we see more countries going through the challenges which Sri Lanka is currently going, um, and you know with massive debt, not being able to service the debt, um, and uh, you know a flourishing country has suddenly got, gotten into a situation where they cannot buy medicines and they cannot buy fuel in the in the span of just a few months. So clearly, I believe that this is an issue, this is going to be a much bigger issue. And that means, of course, as you rightly said, the monetary policies will be tightened. That means the most vulnerable are the ones who will suffer the most. Uh, generally the ones with the resources, they may suffer a little bit, but they don't, they don't suffer as much. And that means further increase on the humanitarian needs and assistance. That means the same donors ha will have having to come up with additional resources. I think we will be getting into a, a, a vicious circle, uh, which, Hopefully we can avoid, but I agree with the question that uh, this may uh, become a real issue for many, many countries uh, in, the, in the months to come, unfortunately. Yeah, indeed. Well, Secretary General, thank you very, very much for uh, a wonderful um, talk and Q&A session. Thank you for being so generous in, in responding to the various comments and questions. We have all uh, uh, been hugely impressed by what you've told us about and the insights you've given us. Um, so on behalf of everybody who's been listening in, I'd like to thank you warmly. Um, I, I, I take away many um, uh, particular important observations and I have to say that example you gave about Ebola, I think that's a very powerful one uh, about listening to the people. I remember reading about that at the, at the, at the time uh, and that's a very a uh, concrete example of understanding local sensitivities, local needs, and translating them immediately into uh, give, giving practical effect to them. So thank you very, very much for coming. We hope that we'll see you again uh, in person in, in, in Dublin. And in the meantime, um, we wish you every success with your ongoing work. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you for this opportunity. I feel really humble and honored. Thank you. Yes.